are, because it's in August, like I said, this is generally the hottest month of the year, we are going to be talking about one of the hottest and most challenging books in the Bible. We are going to be turning up the heat in August, and we're going to be looking at the book of Malachi. And if you have read this book, you know where we're going with this one. Um, But we're going to be looking through a very challenging book and a very helpful book. But before we get into the book itself, what I want to do is kind of help expand and I think improve our view of heat and fire. So I'm going to show you guys a picture. Now, when you see photos like this and you see fire in an open space, I think our first reaction is, fire! Right? Get help! Someone put this out. This could be really, really bad. And we know fire can be dangerous. Right? This past week, we had the smoke blow down from up north, and it was in the air. But we also know fire can be very, very beneficial. What if I told you this picture was taken of a fire that was intentionally set to help the forest grow? That's what this is. This was an intentionally set fire in the redwoods to help the forest grow. Fire can actually be a very, very good thing physically, and in our lives spiritually. So what I want to do is let you guys take a look at some of the positive effects of fire in a physical sense. And as we go through Malachi, we're going to look at the positive effects of fire or heat on our spiritual lives. But the first positive effect of fires like what you just saw is that it prepares a seed bed in the forest. It's really good for the soil to have fire set the right time, the right place. It can actually help the forest grow stronger and better. Number two, it cycles nutrients. So it advances those nutrients, it moves them around to the right spot because a fire was set. It can actually be a really good thing. Number three, provides conditions which favor wildlife, allows natural life to progress in a way that we can't make that happen. It can actually be very good to set fire to the right part of the forest at the right time. Number four, it provides a mosaic of age classes and vegetation types. Let me just translate this for you. Diversity. Different age classes, trees, plant life, and different types. Diversity is actually a good thing for the forest and, yes, for us. Number five, reduces the number of trees susceptible to attack by insects and disease. In other words, gets rid of the weak stuff. Okay? Fire comes through. The weak stuff doesn't make it. The strong stuff does and is stronger because of it. And I love number six. Number six, the sixth benefit of forest fires is that it reduces fire hazards. How great is that? Fires set the right time, the right place can actually make sure that further fires don't happen or when they happen, they are smaller. Fire can be a really beneficial thing. And if you've been to Redwood Forest, you've actually seen now they've designated certain sections which they burn at a time and a place to help that forest grow. My argument, I think Malachi's argument as we go through this book, is that the same can be true for you and I. When God turns up the heat in our lives, right time, right place, it can actually be very good for us. So before we get into this challenging book, I want to look at the context of it so you know who this is as much as we know, right? And what we can learn about this before we get into it. So who is Malachi, this author of this challenging book? Nobody knows. No clue who this guy is, because if you look at this name, Malachi, it's not even a proper name format. So when I say proper name format, right? Scott's got a capital S, right? Ryan, capital R, whatever your first name is, you take that first letter, you make it capital, that says that's a proper name. This word isn't. So it's not about this person's name, it's about what the name means. And Malachi means my messenger, All we know about this person, that's frankly all we need to know. God has said, you are the one I'm going to use as my messenger. And a messenger, another way to translate this, is prophet. We need to understand what a prophet is and what a prophet is not. When we think of prophet, I think we tend to think of someone who only predicts the future. That is not necessarily a prophet. Okay? A prophet or a messenger's only job is to relay what God tells them. That's it. That's your job. And if you do that, you do your job perfectly. And that message can be about the future, but it can also be about the present, and it can also be about the past. Prophets speak to all three of those, future, present, and past. And you're going to see some of that in Malachi. But one of the things that's nice about being a messenger, I think, 
and I relate to this a little bit as someone who's called to relay this message, is that you don't shoot the messenger. Right? You look at this book and you're going to see things in here that are a little bit challenging. You're like, wow, how could Malachi write that? Malachi didn't come up with this. Right? God gave him this message for this group of people. Don't shoot the messenger. And I think this is helpful for you guys to hear because I'm guessing that there are times in your life people come to you about this book, the Bible, and say, I don't like this part. Your job is to say, why? Let's talk about that. Let's pray about it. I can handle your questions. I can handle your frustration. I didn't write it. I believe it 100%. I believe it's the word of God. But to actually hold people and listen to them as they have their challenges with this part of the book, it's okay. But walk alongside of them. Encourage them. And don't shoot the messenger, right? Now, where is this book? If you've turned in your Bible to it, you've noticed that it is the last three pages before you get to the New Testament. It's the last book of the Old Testament. So this is the last book that we have before Jesus came to earth. Once we get through this book in the next four weeks, I think you'll understand better why people had so many questions and challenges for Jesus. Why did Jesus come in this form as a baby? We were looking for something different. And after you look through this book, I think you'll understand more why they had those questions for Jesus. When was it written? Ballpark, approximately 500 B.C. So understand five centuries, approximately, before Jesus. So by the time Jesus comes, they are itching to see this Lord, this ruler, okay? And at the time it was written, God's people were under Persian rule. We've talked a little bit about this here in the past, right? God's people go across they're wandering, they get to the promised land, they get to the promised land, that doesn't last very long, they get out, they're exiled to Babylon, they're under Babylonian rule, then they come back, but even when they come back, they're under Persian rule, and so this people, at this time, they want to be under new management. You guys gone around, you've seen those stores, right, of those restaurants, they put that sign up, it says, under new management, which should say to us, right, if you were here, like five years ago, and you had bad food, come back. Right? We're under new management. Everything is going to be okay now. God's people are saying, God, we are tired. We are tired of this management. We're tired of Babylonians. We're tired of Persians. God, we want you to rule. We want you to rule. And that's the context for this book. Because what it's about, this book, if you were to summarize it, this book is a challenge to people's view of Yahweh God's lack of interest or power. Let me put this in a little simpler terms. Okay? This would be like us looking at God and saying, God, where have you been? Malachi is God's response to us saying, where have you been? I've been right there. Where have you guys been? How have you not been following me? That's what the book of Malachi is all about. So we're going to look at Malachi 1 today, and I think the best summary for chapter 1 is just pollution. Okay? Not necessarily pollution of the sky, but pollution spiritually, and specifically the pollution of the priests. So let's get right into Malachi 1.1. 1, 1. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, when you read that word oracle, you might be thinking of this lady, if you're a Matrix fan, all right? This is not the oracle, right? An oracle is not necessarily a person, the word Massah is actually a very powerful and important word in the Old Testament, and it means utterance, which isn't super helpful because I could utter anything, right? Oracle, we're still trying to figure out what that word means. Load or burden, there we go. This should send us a little flag, a little warning. It says, hey, what you're about to hear, it's tough. It could be a little bit of a heady load. It could be a burden, but hold on. Keep reading what this definition means. It's a lifting or a tribute I, Malachi, am I going to help you carry that load? I, God, am going to help you understand this challenge for your life and for your walk in here for your priests. So it's a trigger. It should let us know this is going to be a little bit hard, but God's going to help get us through it in the next four weeks. Let's look at this first passage, verses 2 through 5. I've loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I've loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. I've made his hill country a desolation and his heritage a desert for jackals. If Edom says we are shattered, 
but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down until they are called the wicked country, the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. So here at the beginning, Malachi addressed one of the protests, the concerns of God's people. They're saying, God, how have you loved us? Remember the question, God, where have you been? And God's response is very simple. I've loved you by protecting you from your enemies. I don't think we think about this enough. God has hugely protected us. When you go to God in prayer and when you thank him, put this on your list of thanks. God, thank you for protecting us from our enemies. God is saying, you haven't seen me, but I have been there to protect you. Think about it as a church. We get to sit here in this building feeling, I would hope, comfortably and safe, knowing that you come here to worship God out loud and you're not very concerned about the consequences. Do you know how many millions of people can't say that right now? God loves you in the way that he protects you. This is a message that's really powerful for me. Um, I am a pretty protective person. I always have been. I tend to be very protective of those close to me, and I see that as a way of loving them, of looking out for them, and God is the one who originated that. He says, I have loved you by protecting you, by keeping your enemies away or down. Now, the next passage is a little bit tough because he starts to talk about Esau, and there's a very controversial, very tough statement that's made about God hating Esau. Esau. When you think about God and you think about hate, you're like, whoa, 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 how can this be? So I want to help you guys understand this a little better, and we're going to look at that word hate, okay? That word hate in Hebrew is sane, and it just means hate, but when you read that, that's not super helpful, right? Because you think about hate, you think about human hate, and the emotion and the feeling that goes into that. That's not hate in the form, especially in the Old Testament, as God would use that word. To understand this word, let's look back at Genesis 29, 31. One of the first times this word is used it relates to Leah. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, or sane, there's that word, and it's translated there, unloved. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So this is a little bit helpful. The opposite of love is hate. When God saw that she was unloved, God loved her. Now, the other thing you should see about this is what he really saw was that Leah wasn't chosen. And what's great about this passage is God comes in and says, I choose you, even if the world didn't. Hated, in other words, is about being unloved and more specifically, not chosen. Not chosen by God. Now, God knew we would have a tough time with this passage. Hence, Romans 9, 13 to 14 and 15 and 16, okay? He knew this one's going to be tough. So let's read through it. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who shows mercy. This is a challenging message from God. God's saying, if I want to have mercy on him, I'm going to have mercy on him. If I have compassion on him, I'm going to have compassion on him. And it is not for us to understand or judge who he decides to show his mercy or his compassion. Okay? This, for me, is like God's equivalent of my parents telling me, because I told you so. I don't know about you guys, but I never handled that one very well, okay? It's tough to hear. They're in charge. We're not. He is most definitely in charge, and I am not. And his mercy and his compassion is way smarter than us. And so if God chooses, he chooses, and that's up to him, not to us. But what I want you to understand here is this word, this sane, is not about the human feeling of hate, Okay? It's about God's choice, and it's his faithfulness to that choice. You'll notice he says here, I chose Jacob, and then he kept choosing Jacob. He stuck with that decision. His faithfulness has remained with that decision. This is something that should really encourage us, because God's chosen you. He's chosen us, right? If we are believers in Jesus Christ, 
God has chosen you. And so the question for you is, have you chosen God? And I have four weeks. This book has three pages, right, to get us all the point where we say, yes, God, we choose you. The reason we're doing this book this month is because we're going to do the fourth chapter on the 27th when we're all in that park for that church service, and we want God to lead anyone who hasn't made that choice to come forward and say, yeah, I want to go in that water. Take me down to the river. Let me go all in because I choose the one who chose me before he made me. That's why we're doing this book this month. That's what God is calling us to, to choose him and put him first. But on this hate, this unchoosing thing, what I need you guys to understand, right, is that hate, this whole choosing judgment thing, is not our department, right? Jesus made this abundantly clear in Matthew 5, 43 to 45. He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. It's God's job, not ours. And when I think about this, it's a little bit challenging, right? Because some people are a little bit more challenging than others, all right? But what we need to remember is we got to let God take care of them. Let them handle it. I don't know if you guys have seen these signs. You ever been into a place and they've got this thing up, complaint department, please take a number, and the number is on the pin of a grenade, right? They just don't want to hear your complaints. Or how about this one? Complaint department, push button for service, and the, uh, the button is the trigger on the mousetrap. Or I've definitely seen this one, right? You go up to someone's desk, says, complaint department, 200 miles that way. Don't, don't want to hear it, right? Tired of listening to it, don't want to hear it. This last sign, though, is actually the truest, because what we could say is actually our complaint department is up there. It's up there. We got issues. We got problems with someone. Sinful or not. Bothersome or not. God, you take care of them. I don't. And let him handle it. And that's an example of faith when we do that. Let's look at the uh, last section of chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. A son honors his father and servants their master. If then I'm a father... Where's the honor due me? And if I'm a master, where's the respect due me? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. You say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food on my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not wrong? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now implore the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. The fault is yours. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. And I will not accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And every place incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and the food for it may be despised. What a weariness this is, you say. And you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in the flock and vows to give it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is reverenced among the nations. Tough stuff, right? First pretty basic idea is this, just honor God. Seems obvious, can be tough to two, but it actually should be very natural for us as people, right? We're given two positions, two responsibilities here, right? We are his children, and we are his servants. 
And we are. God has made you. You are his son. You are his daughter. Thus, we should honor the Father. And as his servants, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are called to be serving him. So honor is due him. How do we do that? Well, what this passage does help us understand is how not to do it. Another way of saying honor God, right, is don't dishonor God. How do we dishonor God? By giving him anything less than our best. Anything less than 100% of who we are is dishonoring God. Let me give you an example. Uh, Growing up, my parents were particularly supportive of things I did in school, so academics. And if I had, like, quizzes or tests coming up, my dad would specifically actually put these tests on his calendar and be thinking and praying about it when I had those tests. And then when I took the test and I got the grades, he was also just as interested. And I would come and talk to him about how I did. And I would tell him the grade. And every time I told him the grade, he asked me the exact same question. He said, did you do your best? Now, I've learned that's a very loaded question. Because if I took a test and I got a B, and let's say it was in the area of world history where I was terrible at, That B was my best. I was like, yep, did my best. We're good with the B. But let's say I got an A minus, but it was in math and it was kind of in my sweet spot and I should have nailed it, but I cut corners. I didn't study for it. When he asked me, did you do your best? I felt it right in here because the answer was no, I didn't do my best. My dad wasn't concerned about the B or the A minus. He was concerned about whether or not I did my best. And that was between me and ultimately, God. And I think God has this question for you and I. Did you do your best? And it's not going to be reflected in a grade, and it might not be reflected in what other people see, right? Your specific gifts, your talents. God is going to ask all of us at the end, did you do your best? And that is between you, and that is between him. And my hope and prayer is that we think about that in this next month, And if there's any area of our life where we haven't, we say, all right, God, I got you. Here is where I'm going to do and give you my best in the coming months and coming years. I love this next challenging statement of Malachi. It says, try presenting that to your governor. This is the Malachi version of put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay? This is a very bold statement by Malachi. These blind animals, these bad fruits and other fruits, foods that you're bringing in that you're trying to sacrifice to God, would you give that to your ruler, your human governor? Of course you wouldn't. So if you're not going to give it to a person, why would you give it to God? Okay, I want you to think about it this way in modern terms, all right? I want you guys to do something with me for a second. I want you to use your imagination, and I want you to picture the best person that you know. And if you're seated next to me, you don't need to give him a hug, all right? It's not about that. This is about picturing the very best person that you know. And if you need to close your eyes to do this, you can do it. Just picture them. Right there in front of your minds, I want you to picture the very best person that you know. What would you give them? What would you do for them? And you don't have to say this out loud. You don't necessarily even have to write it down. I want you to process, what would you do for that very best person that you know? The message of Malachi is this. God deserves even more than that. Whatever that thing was, For whoever that is, God's message to us is, I deserve more than that because I created them, your best person, and I created you. And that's the challenging message here in Malachi. Malachi goes so far as to say we should make ourselves sick when we're not honoring God. In verse 9 there, it says, um, implore the favor of God. That word implore is chala, and it means to make yourself sick pacify, entreat, or implore. In other words, down on our knees, forehead on the ground. When we're dishonoring God, we say, God, I feel sick that I have dishonored you. You might have heard the phrase worried sick. You might have been worried sick. You see, somebody hear parents talk about their kids. I was worried sick about you. That's kind of that idea. God, I felt so bad that I dishonored you in this area of my life that I felt sick about it. God wants us to have that kind of passion about our following of him. What we don't want to happen is coming up in the next couple verses, all right? What we don't want to hear is what God says in verse 10. Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors. 
This is a really, really bad thing. Malachi is saying, hey, you guys, you priests, you've messed up the temple sacrifices so much, why don't you just knock it off? Just close the temple doors. Modern equivalent of this, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. God's done. He's tired. He's tired of you coming in here and giving anything less than your best. And then the next statement's real rough. And this is just tough to read. I have no pleasure in in you. Ouch. We, of course, never want to hear this from God. Now, specifically, this was written to the priests, right? You guys understand the situation. They were coming in, and they were giving bad sacrifices. They thought they could lie and cheat God. But you got to be a little careful with this, because New Testament, right after the coming of Jesus, we're all called to be his ministers, his evangelists, the ones who are called to be his servants in the world And so all of us should really kind of feel this pressure not to ever hear these words from God. I have no pleasure in you. Then he goes on and he addresses a very real issue that I think we still have sometimes today. In verse 13, Malachi addresses their complaint. They say, what a weariness this is. The people are tired of serving God. They've served him, right, for years, for generations, and look what it's gotten us. Babylon, Persians, they're just tired. The word here is tula'a, and it means weariness or hardship. Okay, for today, we might not be ruled by Persians, but I think we can all admit there's times in our lives we get tired of following God every day, all the time, in every relationship, right? Every situation, every word in this book. So how do we avoid it? How do we avoid spiritual fatigue? The answer is remarkably common sense. If you are tired, what's the best cure for that? Rest. Thank you. I'm glad no one said coffee. Excellent. Good. Rest, right? If you are tired, go to sleep. If you are tired of following God, rest in Him. And I don't know what this looks like for you. For some of you, it could be prayer. Some of you could be simply, of course, reading this book. Some of you, it's worship. Some of you, it's walking around in the woods with Him. I I don't know what it is for you but I would encourage you to do it. The best way to avoid spiritual fatigue is actually to rest in him. Now, when you're awake, there's actually another really positive way to give yourself energy in your faith walk, and it's gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude is a great jump starter for your faith, specifically gratitude for God. And now, you guys can add to your list of things you're grateful for, right? That he's protected you from your enemies. That's why gratitude is such an important part of your prayer life. As you are grateful to God for what he's given you, even if you're not thrilled with everything that's happened in your life, I guarantee there's some things that you're happy about. And if you're here breathing, there's one of them, right? That gratitude will help you fight spiritual fatigue. But there are no spiritual energy drinks, okay? No Red Bull, no Monster appropriately named, right? What? Exactly. It's not out there. There's no shortcuts with God. Rest. Sit with him. Be grateful for what he's done. Watch that culminate and fuel, really, your faith walk for him. Other thing we're told here not to do is don't be crafty. In verse 14, cursed be the cheat. The word for cheat is nakal, and it means to be crafty. When I say crafty, I am not talking about people who are comfortable in Joann's or Hobby Lobby, right? What I'm talking about is don't be deceitful with God. Don't cheat on God. And again, you might be thinking, all right, I didn't come in here with a one-eyed goat, and I didn't come in here with a rotten fruit to put on the altar. I'm not cheating on God. But there's other ways that we cheat on him. And I want us to know about these so we can avoid doing it. The first one we've already talked about, right? Not giving God 100%. Not giving our best. Number two, putting anything or anyone else first. Classic adultery, right? got your spouse. They need to be number one. Numero uno. God needs to be first in our lives. If there is any one, anything, any situation, any relationship, any circumstance that you've put more time or energy or thought into, you might have put them first. That would be cheating on God. And the last one actually I think is the most obvious, and yet I'm not sure we always think about it. Just not playing by his rules. If you ever play a game with someone, 
right? And you know the game, and they know the game, and they know the rules, and they do something that's just not following the rules. You say, well, what are you doing? You cheated. That's not in the rule book, right? Same goes for our faith walk. We have the rule book. It's right here. And it's really not terribly long. Okay? And you got your whole life to learn it. This is the rule book. When we don't follow the rule book, we are cheating on God. And Malachi is here to call us back to remember that so we don't cheat on him. And as we pause today, we're going to do Malachi 2 next week. As we stop today, we're going to take communion. But when you take communion, I want you to think about how God is described here at the end of Malachi 1. There's two different phrases used to describe God. First is great king. Now, when you think great king... You might think a super important person right on a high throne in a room that's tough to get to. You've got to make an appointment and it's years out. That's a great king. But that's not our God. Our God is the great king who came our direction and can actually be right there in your heart. That's our great king. And when we take communion, we actually get to partake in the one that he's described here as my name is reverenced among the nations. The God who is believed in by literally billions of people right now. We get to partake in him during communion. Just think about that as we pray and take our communion this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for this book. We thank you for Malachi, your messenger. And even though some of the message might be tough for us to hear, it is tough for our good. Specifically, God, for your good. And I pray that we as a people will be refined by your heat and your fire in our lives. And yet we will also be encouraged because you aren't a God who lords it over us without coming our direction. You've had a plan all of eternity. And that eternity was to tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And when we didn't follow that plan, you knew you were going to save us. And you did just that. God, we thank you for sending your son our direction to live a perfect life and then give up that life for us. We remember that now as we take the bread, the body of your son broken for us, as we take the juice, we remember the blood of your son poured out for us, the great king who gave his life for his subjects. We are not worthy and we are grateful and we love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.